rich media. And uh, when, when you hear the term rich media, essentially it's a umbrella term for podcasting, blogging, uh, iTunes, university, using uh, video content, YouTube, Vimeo, screencasts, all those other media that you can embed into your courses. The last couple of weeks we went from nuts and bolts and talking about the dynamics of Moodle and uh, how to add content to Blackboard and how to structure your course and instructional design best practices and visual hierarchy versus the flat module approach and visual consistency, um, content consistency, all of those things we, we've been addressing. Um, now what we're going to talk about is uh, not only Im how to embed uh, all these different types of media, how to use this different type of media, but I think the key point, uh, and we made it last week, is the fact that we have so many different learning, uh, students with different learning styles. And what I've learned over the past 10 years is when I embed a variety of different uh, uh, types of content, certain students are going to go directly to the videos. Certain students go directly to the chapter, read it, and read the text lecture. Some students want to hear the podcast. So different students are drawn to different types of media based on their learning style. And it, it warms my heart when I get emails from students thanking me for giving them the lectures and the materials in a variety of different formats because that's tapping into what's best for the student as far as them comprehending the material. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to um, pop over and let me open up another link here. I'm going to talk a little bit about harnessing uh, the tools. And just like we've been doing in all the other workshops, uh, stop me, throw, it, throw something in the chat box, uh, stop me, just say, Patrick, I've got a question, um, something's not clicking here, whatever, keep it informal. Uh, if I don't hear from you, I'll just move forward. Um, Beth, you mentioned something in your email to me which, which hit home, you know, about, um, you talked about how if you n knew n now what you, you know, as far as you were naive as to all the things that go into this. And um, you just went in with your eyes kind of not aware of all the things that, that go into teaching online. But I think it was, it, it was the right choice to make because um, let's talk about the, uh, the fact that it's growing so fast. So number one, uh, as far as strategies for expanding your e-learning skill, um, we as faculty members, whether it be in art, photography, psychology, whatever, uh, we have to build on our skill sets. And we have to learn to harness the tools and technology for online teaching. And step one is to do it with the understanding the technical part. Step two is being able to not only the uh, uh, embrace the technical part and be comfortable with it, but then to use it to teach effectively. Every bit as dynamic and engaging and proactive as you are in the classroom. So with that said, let me... E-learning uh, is really growing. And, and why is it growing? Let's, let's talk about this for a moment. Number one, it's market-driven. Number two, it's student-driven. Number three, it's technologically driven. Number four, it's budget-driven. I find it interesting um, that when I offer a psych when I was director of distance learning, I offered art appreciation, photo appreciation, psychology, sociology, all these uh, art history. 
the online courses filled almost immediately. Bam, full, cap. Classroom, six students, five students. Not sure we can run it. Oh, get a phone call. Patrick, we need to set up another online section of psychology. We need to set up another online section of art appreciation. What does that tell us? It tell us, tells us that the students want it. I mean, that hits you right in the face. Students want the flexibility. So if we're going to be marketable as and viable as teachers, we're going to have to work comfortably in both environments. Photo and art education is changing very rapidly, and we have to ask ourselves a few things. Do we want to be behind the technological curve or ahead of it? If we want to stay ahead of the technological wave, then we must harness. You're doing exactly what you need to be doing, getting yourselves up to speed with these new techniques and technologies. So um, step number one is what we've been talking about, and that is to master the LMS, to master the learning management system. So Ken and Beth, you're on Blackboard. You want to master that management system. You want, it to, you want to be really comfortable with it. You want to understand all the nuances of it and how to use it most effectively. From that point, you take the LMS and you say, okay, I've got my course management system as my hub, but I need to add other tools, other applications to it to enhance and enrich the learning experience. So for example, if you're teaching digital photography, you might include Skype, you might include Hangouts, you're going to include, uh, you're absolutely going to have to include screen sharing using Jing or ScreenFlow to be able to do little recordings on how to do different things in Photoshop. That doesn't come with the course management system. Okay, so you've got to ask yourself, okay, I've got Blackboard, but what other apps, and usually they're open source apps, can I use to really uh, complement and supplement the course? So when I was teaching the portfolio development class, I used PhotoBucket. PhotoBucket was great because all the students had to put all their images that were to be uh, evaluated for their portfolio into photo bucket. I went to photo bucket. I put a little thumbs up on the ones I thought that had the potential. Then we could go back and forth using the photo bucket as a way to uh, edit and sequence their work. So that was something I did. Another thing I do in almost in many of my courses, I incorporate blogging and WordPress uh, into my courses. I use YouTube in every course, uh, iTunes University in many courses. So you need to educate yourself into what these things do and how you can incorporate these things to uh, en enrich that learning experience. Okay, then you want to develop an online teaching methodology that is a reflection of your personal teaching style. So Beth, your uh, methodology and your style and your approach is most likely going to be very different than mine or Ken's because we have our own way of doing things. And all we want to do is take that approach and modify it into the online environment. So we're still using the way we like to teach in that environment. We have to alter it a little bit, but you still want to keep that uh, integrity of your learning, of your teaching style. An approach that enables your, per and here's the key, and I've heard it from so many students, an approach that enables your personality to come through, an approach that lets students know that you are a compassionate, engaged, enthusiastic teacher on the other end of the computer or the cyberspace that cares about their learning and their success. This is the challenge uh, for online educators, in my opinion, 
and it takes the most time to get there, to climb that method, that learning curve as far as the methodology. So let's look at a cross section of uh, these online tools and see what each one uh, does best. Okay. Um, any any questions? Is this making sense? Okay. Course management system. So what do we have within the course management system? We have the discussion forum, which is asynchronous, where we can have an asynchronous discussion, a dialogue, or show works in progress. Because in the discussion board, images can be posted, voice, uh, audio files can be posted, videos can be posted. So this is asynchronous. Then you have the assignment manager. We talked about this. Uh, Beth, we went through the assignment manager with you two weeks ago. That's where students post finished work, finished art, finished digital art, finished uh, composites, photographs to be graded. Then you've got the lessons uh, that you're using, Beth. You've got the create web pages in Moodle. You've got the test manager in Blackboard. You've got the quiz function, blogs and announcements. So that's what you've got inside the course management system already. So the point I'm trying to make is those are your tools. There's no reason to go and get a quiz function open source when you've already got one. Now that Blackboard and Moodle have blogs, um, you can use that. But the, the problem with the blog uh, component in Blackboard and Moodle is it's inside a password protected environment. So if you're going to have students blogging with their work uh, and having web portfolios, you need to move them out of the password protected environment. We'll talk about that later. Okay, uh, open source, open source. So what are some things we can use to complement? What are some things we can use to complement? the course management system, all right? So YouTube and Vimeo, great for embedding tutorials that you create or you find in YouTube or Vimeo. YouTube for lectures under 10 to 15 minutes, Vimeo for over 15 minutes. Anything you ever wanted to know about Photoshop, for example, is in the tutorial on YouTube. You just have to find the most appropriate the most appropriate tutorials for your lesson. All right, is everybody okay? We look like we have some technical. Can you still hear me? I got two best now. All right, um, slideshare.net. Um, and all of these things um, you'll have access to, 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 to look at and to play with. Um, Jing. J-I-N-G. Jing is great for doing quick and dirty screencasts. What is a screencast? It basically records everything you do on the screen. It's great for Photoshop lessons. It's great for InDesign lessons, showing students how to do things on the screen. Can you still hear me, Ken? I lost your audio. That is so weird. And no, you didn't even do anything. It just happened, huh? Weird. Can you hear me? You can hear me. All right. Um, let me just keep going, and we'll um, we'll use the chat function until we can troubleshoot it. Beth, can you talk? Let me hear you. I can hear you. Uh, mm -hmm. and I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right. Um, so use the chat function here if you've got a question. Um, Camtasia for the PC people. Camtasia is a great screencast tool. Um, now, here's something you're going to all want to download. You want to download Audacity. A-U-D-A-C-I-T-Y. It is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best open source programs you're going to find. It's for editing audio. And it enables you to do podcasting 
right on your computer, a PC or a Mac. Um, it's an excellent audio uh, editing software. I've got all the links on the on the course page. And it also, uh, you can drop the audio uh, MP3 files. Say you're doing a lecture and you audio tape it in, in uh, Audacity. You can drag and drop that MP3 directly into iMovie or directly into Movie Maker for your, and then put pictures to it like a, a slideshow, like an audio slideshow. All right, Ken's back. Can we hear him now? Can we hear you, Ken? Okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good, okay. All right, um, so again, these are tools, these are tools that we want to think about as far as complementing our courses. Uh, iMovie, Movie Maker, Camtasia will allow you to create visually sophisticated enhanced podcasts. So what's, what's the difference between a podcast and an enhanced podcast? Mm -hmm. An enhanced podcast has pictures. Uh, when you hear the term podcast or instructional podcast, it's just audio. It's an audio lecture. So if I'm in class and I'm doing a hybrid and I keep a little I keep a little microphone on my collar with my iPod and I record my lecture on Gestalt theory and then I post that the next day that's a podcast that's so just audio but then I take that podcast I put it into iMovie and I drop images on it and I make it an MP4 and I throw it up in YouTube now I've got an enhanced podcast can I ask a question? Absolutely, Beth. Um, when you're using your iPod to do the lectures, I thought that's what I was going to do initially. Yes. Um, what are you like? What app are you using? Because when I was just using the voice recorder, it wasn't in, uh, it wasn't the right format or something. Let me show you, Beth. I'm going to get out of screen share. Beth, I use the Belkin. Okay. I, I use the Belkin. It goes directly on. All right, I'm doing a commercial here. Here's my iPod. Mm -hmm. The Belkin goes into where you power it up, and it allows me to do record my lectures. Okay. So I keep this in my pocket or on a table with a long cord. And this is amazing how sensitive this is. It'll pick up even from eight, ten feet away. So that's better than using the internal mic. Well, on the I, iPod. Well, if you can get you get the newer, do the newer ones have the internal mic? Because this one is, I have an older one. Oh, okay. So if you've got just the regular iPod, use the Belkin, or I also use. I use these. Yeah, I think I have one of those. Something it's like a digital recorder. Voice yeah, record. digital recorder. But uh, here's the thing, Beth or, and Ken, if you get a digital recorder, make sure you get the one with the USB directly built into it. Okay. You'll get better audio and better downloads to uh, Audacity. All right. So what you do is you take your audio file from the digital recorder or the microphone or the iPod and you plug it in and you download it directly into Audacity and then you edit it in Audacity and then you say you export it as an mp3 and then I'm going to show you how to put the mp3 directly into Blackboard could you explain what Audacity is? Yes. Again, I missed yes. that. Yeah, no problem. Let me go back to my uh, screen share. All right, where am I? Uh, here. Audacity. Uh, can Audacity, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna show you where I have all the links for you that you can go ahead and download it. 
Audacity is an open source audio editing program. So the beauty of Audacity is as soon as you get done with your podcast, with your audio lecture, you plug it into your laptop, you file open your, your recording into Audacity. You quickly edit out the ums and the uhs and the, you know, the little pauses. And what I love about it is when students ask questions from like five seats back, I'll have that, but that's lower than my voice. In Audacity, I can bring that audio as loud as my voice. Or I can edit out their their sneezes and stuff. So um, I can I have some um, tutorials on how to use it, which I'll send out to you. So as far as I'm concerned, it's the best software for editing your your audio podcasts, and it's free and free is good. Um, okay. Uh, as far as screen sharing is concerned. Oh, okay, going back. And then the podcast, you can put in iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Or you can put them uh, directly into your Blackboard. Now, let's talk about this for a moment because this is important. When you make a podcast or you make a video, if your podcast is 20 minutes, that could be 50, 60 megabytes, okay? Now, every college has a different IT, uh, what do you call it, uh, procedures and rules. So some colleges will say, you know, you're not allowed to put those giant files on our Blackboard because it's just too much and we don't have a big enough server. Or they'll limit the size. So the alternative is, Yes, I can embed lectures, audio lectures, directly in Blackboard, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And if it's okay, like my college, they, they didn't have a problem with it. Um, I have two colleges that do have a problem with it and two that don't. So that's something you've got to find out from your IT people. Um, I don't get along well with IT people. I don't know why. I think it's my right brain um, artist mentality. I just never, I've always butt heads with IT people. My husband's an IT person, yeah, and I just I, I keep my mouth shut because I know I need him. So <laughs> to fix my problem. So I'm I try not to be saying nice it's bad. Possible. I'm just saying I just always yeah was out of sync. Yeah, I understand. Um, they're so left brain and I'm so right brain. Uh, now the point here is this: you can put these the, this this content directly into your courses. Uh, there's a way to do it, and the and the uh, and the text editor allows you to do it. But you need to make sure that what the uh, the regulations of the college, as far as doing it, uh, you're usually better off to create your own YouTube channel, and or if your college has iTunes University, which ours does, and then put it all into those uh, content repositories, because what you're doing then is linking to it, and it's not putting that uh, memory uh, drag onto your college server, okay? All right, Skype. Um, now, we're, again, everything I'm talking about relates to what we want to be using as satellite applications for complementing and supplementing your course. Because what is the goal that we're always going for? I want my course to be every bit as engaging, dynamic, unique, proactive, and enjoyable and instructional as my classroom version. So I got to use a lot of this stuff. Skype. Skype is what I use every morning for my office hours. I have office hours from 7.30 to 8.30 every five days a week. And all my students know that if they want to get a hold of me and talk to me, all they have to do is send me a, a little text message in Skype. Are you available? I have a question. And then, Mr. Keogh, I really don't understand the appropriate way to attribute my sources in my midterm paper. Do you want MLA? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, John, this is this is what I want you to do. And I have my office hours that way. I also use it, my students that are classroom, 
have the choice of using it for their office hours instead of meeting me at, at somewhere. They can do it that way. So Skype is a fantastic tool for that. Uh, Twitter. Have you all do you all use Twitter? I use Twitter to send out reminders. Hey, don't forget the exam is due tomorrow night. Just a reminder, gentle reminder. Exam's got a or the research paper. It's just a compliment to the announcement page. Uh, yes, Ken. Can you lift the um, mailing list from Blackboard out so that you can use those names yes. in, in a regular emailer? Yes. You can. All you have to do is go to the users link, click on the users link in the control panel, Ken, yeah. and it'll give you a list of all the names and emails, Okay. and you can just copy and paste them. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Dropbox, I know... I no longer use the Dropbox in um, Blackboard. I just found that the assignment manager is much better because the Dropbox is a place to store content and pictures, but it, it, there's not a good um, interactive uh, tool for giving feedback. So that's why I use the assignment manager. WordPress blog. Uh, all my students in all my photography courses uh, all have to do e-portfolios. And WordPress, as far as I'm concerned, is the very best, easy, user-friendly web uh, tool to do e-portfolios. We teach a travel photography class, and all the students have to post daily updates on their travel photography hey I'm at the um, I'm, at, I'm heading to the Louvre I'm gonna get some pictures uh, of some of the art and then we're heading over and I'm gonna photograph the uh, uh, the Rodin uh, sculptures in front of the Rodin Museum you know so we have this travel class which is really successful because kids go all over one student took a train ride to uh, New Orleans and documented it as a travel blog and they were updating from their cell phone on their on their to their blog, and, and their teacher could keep track of their project. Uh, I'm a big proponent of educational blogging. All my students set up a portfolio blog the second year of the photo program. They set up pages in each for each discipline, like portraiture, sports, action, fine art, documentary, commercial illustration. In addition to posting their artist statements, resumes. And then you, I'm going to show you some examples uh, of student blogs. Uh, have you heard of iTunes University? Yes. All right. Uh, iTunes University, and we have our own iTunes University at our college, so I can store all my podcasts. I have like almost 200 in iTunes. If you don't have an iTunes site, um, you can create an account and put your content up, or... Uh, what's really neat about iTunes University, um, Ken, what are the other courses besides digital? Do you teach history of photography? No. No, I teach uh, Introduction to Multimedia, which uses WordPress. Okay. And uh, I also teach uh, Intro to Computer Graphics, which is a 3D studio uh, course doing 3D modeling and things like okay, that. Okay, so let's say, Ken, that you're doing a hybrid course on the 3D course. And you want to add some new content to your course. There are literally thousands upon thousands. When you sign up to put content into iTunes University, when you sign up, you've got to write a disclaimer stating that your content is open and free, meaning that you can go and grab a lecture on 3D theory or whatever. I'm just throwing that out. And drag and drop it's an mp3 file you download it into your uh, your personal iTunes on your computer and then you can upload it into your course I'll give you a perfect and I'm talking of thousands upon thousands of lectures wow. video lessons all open to you to incorporate into your classes I'll give you a perfect example uh, a couple of two years ago I was teaching a a, a module on Van Gogh and um, 
we were having a conversation on the discussion board about Vincent Van Gogh and his and his style of painting, post impressionism, blah blah blah. So I went to iTunes University, and it just so happened that the Met Museum was having a post impressionism Van, Van Gogh show, and this art historian from Paris gave a forty five minute lecture, and it was a podcast. I downloaded it and I embedded it into my discussion board and that was our discussion topic for the week. Listen to the podcast and we're going to have a conversation about what you learned from this podcast about Vincent Van Gogh. I didn't have to do it. All I had to do was find a good lecture and embed it into my course. So the, the uh, possibilities are endless with iTunes University. Photo bucket and Flickr. I'm going to show you. Uh, let me go ahead real quick and show you my iTunes University. Okay, what you're seeing here is the Carter, I, I, Carteret Community College is my home college. It's where I teach most of my classes and where I retired from. So this is our iTunes University. Interior design, aquaculture. You see this aquaculture dude, he's got 181 podcasts. Associates of Arts, which is basically my art history lectures, there's 65. Photography. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Hopefully it didn't uh, time out. Got to find it now. Uh, it timed out. Sorry, darn it. I'll have to re-go uh, into it. The point here is when you click on the photography tab, you'll see graphic design, fundamentals of photography. You'll see more tabs for each course. And within each course, you're going to have uh, 10, 15 lectures that students, for example, I'm teaching graphic design now. My students have a midterm exam. My midterm lecture is in this folder, and they can download it and listen to it on their mobile device or at their computer. All right. I'll go back in a little after I'm done with this and show you uh, exactly what I'm talking about. Um, photo bucket's great. Flickr's great for for. Students putting up images, uh, sequencing images, commenting on images. If you want to have it do a whole series of work, great for documentary photography. Uh, great for photojournalism. Uh, sharing and commenting and have students commenting. If you're a uh, Mac person, iMovie 2 is excellent for doing video podcasts. Movie Maker is the best uh, tool for PC. I love using Keynote. What I like about if you're a Mac person, Keynote is great because you can take your PowerPoints and convert them. I don't know if you know this. You both are Mac, right? Do you have Keynote? Keynote is awesome. You can literally take a PowerPoint and put an audio file and make it a podcast right from Keynote. Uh, if you're one, if you're if you're really not into doing a lot of typing, uh, you should get Dragon. Uh, naturally speaking, it's about ninety-five dollars. Get your just get your um, your program coordinator to order it for you, and so you can sit at your computer and, and give comments about the students, and it turns it right into type, right into text. Yes, Ken. Yeah, uh, my wife uh, requested that, like maybe. 10 or 15 years ago when it first came out, it was over at Staples. So I went over there and I got it and I installed it and I went, had, you had to have a learning process at that yes, point. Yes, right? absolutely. So I sat there, I, I was practicing and she came in and said, all right, I want to try it. I said, well, you, you really have to let it kind of adapt to your way of speaking. She said, well, let me just try it. So she sat down and she said, hello, my name is Candace. And it typed out, elbow, I'm from Kansas. <laughs> But well, that was 15 years ago. Maybe yeah, it's, yeah, it's become much more uh, sophisticated now. 
Yeah. I mean, even with my cell phone, it's got the voice mode where I can just do text messages. And I'm amazed at how almost perfect it gets in almost every time. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm one of these people. I have to type it because the way I talk is different than when I'm typing out a, a discussion board post. I think differently than when I'm talking it, speaking it. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, then we have, uh, then we have um, a Yammer. Uh, Yammer is a great educational social network tool. Uh, and again, you have access to everything I'm showing you. Yammer is basically Facebook. Yammer is free. It's Facebook for uh, business and teaching. So you can create a Yammer group with your students. And it's, I mean, it has the same look and feel as Facebook, but it's for complementing a learning environment or a business environment. And you can post, uh, have discussions, you can post pictures, videos, uh, but it is a uh, social network and you all have to have the same email address. In other words, it's for certain domains. So at my school, it's carteret.edu. So I can put anybody with carteret.edu in. Nobody else can get in it unless you invite them as a guest. Uh, other things I use is uh, online tutorials, lynda.com, adobe.com. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Can I ask you about lynda.com? Yeah. I'm assuming that the like that your school has a subscription to that for you some, to be able to Some schools do. Some schools don't. You can request it. Uh, Beth, there's a lot of free lynda.com stuff out there. So they've got their different levels. They have their open source level where you can get some basic Photoshop tutorials in design. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to go into super in-depth stuff, you get a, you get a license. Okay. So there's just like a lot of different things, there's different levels to it. For example, WordPress, there's the complete free version that gives you two, two gigabytes of free space. If you want to upgrade, you pay $89. No, you can upgrade for $18 to get your own domain name. And then for $99, you can get all of the bells and whistles without any ads or anything like that. So it's the same thing. Uh, I use a lot of Lynn. I teach uh, InDesign. And I haven't found anything better than Lynda.com with InDesign. Well, just for fun, I, I've been watching their um, – ACU has a license, so I get to watch videos, and they're just phenomenal. I love them. Yeah, they're very – that's why I like them. They're so professional. Yeah. And we want our content to be professional. So I just hit you with a whole bunch of different types of open source satellite applications. So remember, the key to this first part of this session is you've got your course management system. Blackboard or Moodle or whatever. And then can the applications and the open source tools that you need might be different than Beth and Steve and me. I know the ones I like to use, but the ones I like to use are the best for what I do. And you want to be able to find the very best tools that match up what you're teaching, whether it be lynda.com, whether it be creating your own video lectures, pulling for example my colleague Kathy and I we both teach the history of photography another colleague of ours Jeff Kurtzo do you know Jeff Kurtzo he's on the board of SPE now. oh yeah I know him. yeah yeah I was on a panel with him last year great yeah. guy a great yeah. guy and many yeah. years and in fact I have to give him credit he's the one that got me podcasting because hmm. I went to his podcasting uh, presentation at SPE many years ago mm -hmm. and at the mm -hmm. end he said, I asked him, I said, you know, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. He said, well, listen, Patrick, here's the URL. Feel free to use any of my content. Wow. So now we use his, he's got a great history of photo lectures for every module. I put the lecture in, in, in addition to mine, just to give them another, here a different, ver you know, not a version, a different approach. Because it, he's got it in iTunes. It's, it's free. So that's where I got turned on to podcasting was from him and his photo history lectures. So the trick is, 
to know when and where and how to use these tools, these resources most effectively to accomplish whatever learning objective you are addressing. You must be aware that these online tools and applications are constantly evolving. Just like uh, we talked about with the dragon, uh, naturally speaking, Ken, it started off very unsophisticated, but now it's much better than it was 10 years ago. And as it changes, you have to retool your courses accordingly. Online faculty or faculty in general must accept the reality that there is no standing still in the world of e-learning. We are all lifelong learners and essentially students as well. The online environment has forced us as educators to also be facilitators, moderators, and guides to the learning journey instead of the sage on the stage. Those educators who are aware of this reality and ready and willing to navigate the digital technological terrain will be the most successful, in demand, and marketable. And especially, Ken, with you retiring, you, you said you're going to be retiring. If you've got these skill sets, you can do like I do every morning. I got my coffee. I'm teaching um, portfolio development, graphic design, art appreciation. You know, I work until about noon. Uh, and, and at the end of the month, the check goes into my bank account. <laughs> you know what? It's, it's not bad. It's not bad. So that's kind of like um, the big picture. Let me stop for a moment um, and uh, see uh, how's that sound to you both. I mean, any questions about what we just hit on? Uh, you've got two months worth of uh, things to play with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all kinds of stuff to explore. Yes, and Ken, um, the main gist of these VASA workshops is we can't do everything in six weeks, but what we can do is plant seeds. And, and, and kind of uh, open up, you know, new, give you new ideas. And then you've got to pursue <clears throat> and move forward and, and then problem solve it. But trying to give you as many, uh, as much information, ideas to uh, kind of sift through as you move forward with your instructional uh, journey, teaching uh, your photography courses. Let me get the next part here. All right. All right, now I'm going to take what we just did and take it a little bit into a little bit more detail. All right. Um, at the end of this PowerPoint, um, in the, actually, let me show you this real quick. I just want to show you where I've linked everything for you. For every lesson, it says VASA Workshop 3. So I put all of the everything that I do in the lesson into that block. So right now, we're on podcasting, rich media. So here, I've got all of the links you need to access all the stuff we talked about. How long will these be live? Uh, you'll have access to them as long as you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have to literally take you out of the system for you to lose access, and I'm not going to do that okay. anytime soon. So if you click on podcasting for instruction, blogging, YouTube, these two links here take you to every link and every uh, every link and every and information about Let's see if you can see that stuff. Yeah. So it's got iTunes University, how to download uh, Audacity, how to make MP3s, how to enhance your teaching with it, podcasting best practices, two different links on that, 
how to produce them and incorporate them into your teaching, a podcast workflow, how to edit the audio, a tutorial on literally how to edit your audio files. Okay, there's Audacity. Uh, it's got podcasting for instruction, podcasting made simple, podcasting recording and editing tools, how to podcast tutorial, and a video that I made, um, and a podcast and a podcast about podcasting. So yeah, everything you need right there. And um, the same with the blogging. The PowerPoint I'm beginning I'm getting ready to give you. If you click on this link, it's all hot linked. So all of the resources are hot linked, whereas the uh, the PowerPoint they're just static. So you've got all the hot links, the video tutorials, the examples of student portfolios, the benefits of blogging, how it can enhance my teaching, how to create a WordPress website, uh, how to uh, things to avoid with instructional blogging, student web portfolio examples, YouTube, how to do YouTube, how to put the uh, YouTube videos into your Blackboard, uh, examples of my YouTube lectures, my YouTube PowerPoints, and how to, again, how to put content, video and audio content into Blackboard. All right, so I just wanted you to know how to access that those things that we've been talking about for your uh, personal information. Okay, so we're going to go to the second half of the workshop today and uh, pick up. I was basically just kind of giving big picture stuff in that first part. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Uh, okay, so these tools and techniques can be used as a supplement to Blackboard or Moodle or any viable online course management system. Now, I'm going to break it down into three parts, blogging, and then uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, podcasting and YouTube. Uh, blogging is a great way to supplement your online classes and get students engaged, engaging each other on a variety of topics. Uh, I incorporate student blogs into my second year photography courses. Blogs can also be used to keep journals, document activities and projects, post articles, stories, research, uh, based on the parameters that you set for the class. So, for example, for example, uh, Say you're teaching, we teach a documentary photography course at our college, and uh, also the travel photography course. Does that include video? Yes. Okay, it's taught by the still people, or is it taught by the video people? Well, at our college, we are both. I, but, I teach still, and I teach video. Okay, well, because that's that was a big issue at SPE, and it's coming up at Seton Hall all the time because we're split between the the video film side of the department and the the computer graphics and design and everything else. And of course, yeah, the technology uh, now, you know, it's all coming together. Everything, Ken. That's a great point. Everything's coming together. Everything's merging. I mean, I teach the graphic design class. I teach multimedia. I teach. Uh, more of the second year advanced courses, but we don't have a distinction between the media people, the graphics people, and the still people. We are all doing, we're all multitasking. But then again, we're a smaller school. Okay? Mm -hmm. So blogging, um, so the point I was trying to make with documentary is if a student, uh, say a student here at my college is going to do a documentary on the uh, on the, uh, we've had the kids do a lot of these documentaries on the, um, on the uh, wildlife shelter, you know, owls and and dolphins and all kinds of pelicans and you know get hurt. Well, anyway, they they would use the blog to update 
and and keep a track of the images they're shooting. And the beauty of the WordPress blog is it gets out to everybody. So um, uh, somebody from Australia might say, "Hey, I'm really impressed with that blog, John. You know, I I I, I, it's, I find it interesting how that you've got a wildlife uh, uh, shelter in in your county." Blah blah blah. So it's just a great way to, for them to start. Th and here's the, here's the reason: when students realize that what they're writing and what they're posting is seen by the world, it makes them think a whole lot harder than when they're posting to the discussion board mm -hmm. in a password protected environment, like they're texting you. So it's oh my god! I mean, anybody can see this. So blogging is a great interactive tool. Uh, uploading photos is easy. Uh, I can incorporate, I literally have Flickr and PhotoBucket directly embedded into my blog uh, with the widgets. And you can also embed videos uh, from Vimeo, Google, and YouTube directly into your blog, which is real, or student blogs. Now, just like anything else, I can't stress this enough. I really want to stress this point because we, you both, and, and Steve, you've, we've all been. There's so many things out there, like you said, Ken. There's all you know. There's so many things to be thinking about and learning, but without a plan, you know, you don't want to shoot the shotgun out there and just hope scatter everything and hope something hits. You want to think about what am I teaching? What is the learning objective of this module? And what, what will best work in the online environment for me to get them to understand it, to do it, and to show me that they, and to assess that they, they've learned it. So just like anything else, start with a plan for incorporating rich media and blogs into your classes. Decide just how you want to incorporate blogs into your online hybrid class. Don't incorporate blogging into your course if it is not going to contribute to the student learning or reinforce the course content that your students are studying. You know, a lot of these things are really cool. Some of them are kind of like in the bells and whistles mode, but you don't want to use these things for the sake of using them. You want to use things applications, open source type of programs that really target and supplement what you're teaching the students. And that just comes with time and experience. Some things work better than others. Uh, once students have created their blogs and posted a welcome message, pictures, and short biography, uh, give them an assignment and follow through by posting a comment um, I learned this the hard way. I gave my students, and I start their uh, blogging. Um, we have a two-year associate's degree in photography. We introduced the portfolio blogs in the um, in the second semester of the second year at the midpoint, and that's what I'm getting ready to do next week for my graphics students because they have to graduate with a comprehensive website. We used to do this in-house. We used to do this in-house using a Dreamweaver, and then I would post their websites to the server. But the downside to this, the good side was I could use it for marketing and all that. The downside was working through the IT depart department and getting them to update links, post new links, uh, those type of things. It got to the point where it was just forget it. I'm two years behind now. So WordPress allows me to have these links. The students will continue to use the blogs or not, but the ones that continue to use them, I have access to them, and I can show other students what they've done and how they can use it, and I don't have to manage it anymore. Whereas I was spending a lot of time managing these websites when you've got, you know, I put over 200 students through the program. Now, the, the, the mistake I made was I gave the students the assignment to do the blog and everything, but um, I didn't, I wasn't diligent enough at first to check them out and to 
to let them know, you know, give them feedback, enough feedback. So now what I do is I make it a point to post comments and do some critiquing of their site design wise um, and maybe theme wise. And when they see their instructor posting posts directly to their blog, they take they're going to do more work with it. I, I learned when I when I follow through on my end more. So uh, as I said, all my second year photography students create web blogs, and basically they can't graduate without a complete web presence. So I make blogging an integral part of my, and I call it e-portfolio. It's an e-portfolio. I make blogging an integral part of my photography art course. So they cannot graduate. Uh, does that look familiar to you? Um, does this look familiar to you? Do you know what? Discussion yeah. board, blackboard, right? Mm -hmm. So before they graduate, I, I tell them, I will not submit your final grades. I will not submit your final grades until you post the URL of your blog, hmm. of your web portfolio. And I have a very tight rubric, meaning you must have a resume on that, a downloadable resume, artist statement, and your different discipline, your best portraits, your best fashion, your best commercial illustration, your best, uh, your, your complete portfolio, it basically has to mirror their print portfolio. So everything in their print portfolio has to be categorized in their web portfolio. And I make a big stink about it because I'm starting this next week and they have until July 30th to finish it. So I say, if you don't post, if, if it doesn't match up, you have an incomplete. Why do I do that? I do that because I'm not going to let them leave the program because it's a reflection on us. It's a reflection on our program if it's not meets, doesn't meet my, my standards. What about discussion? Uh, is there any explanation regarding each of the assignments? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as, are you talking about the assignments for the blog or the assignments? Uh, the individual postings, do they describe uh, the assignment uh, objective or do they talk well, about the ones they post? Well, throughout the semester we're building, throughout the semester each week, they're posting uh, lecture overviews of different things about marketing, about advertising, about self-promotional, about business, about um, uh, sequencing, all those things. So really at the very end, uh, they have to post their rough resumes and then I help them uh, uh, edit the resumes. So it's a continual process. So at the very end, I tell them, you know, we've been, we've been fine tuning this every week. In other words, post me a work in progress of your blog and I'll give you feedback and other students will give them feedback. But at the very end, it's, all right, it's showtime. Your resume's got to be done. Your artist statement's got to be done. So what do I do? I give them 10 different examples of artist statements, and they have a week to write one. When it's done, they upload it as a document or a PDF to their blog. Okay, so for example, um, for example, um, this was Rihanna White. She has a vi so what she did was she did a video, a video portfolio which she embedded, and on the right you can't see this, but on the right it's got commercial photography. These are pages, they're links: commercial photography, portrait photography, my resume, my artist statement. Uh, photojournalism, documentary photography. I, I can't, re but that's essentially what it's got to look like. It's got to have all the different categories that they learned. And they can pick any theme they want. You know, they can pick themes and they have a little introduction about themselves and then the links to the different uh, categories. 
here's my commercial. And you can see these in those links that I gave you. Commercial photography, um, portrait photography, things like that. Okay, uh, so just a few last word on blogs is it's not for every class, but for certain classes like travel photography, um, documentary photography, the final portfolio, e-portfolios, it's really great. Uh, it might not be a great tool for a basic beginning class, you know, a d basic digital photography. Although multimedia, I could see it being used where students are posting uh, videos and, and uh, depending upon the types of multimedia you're doing. Uh, but it is a great tool because it's free. It's very user friendly. It's not a hard tool to use and upload content. And the themes, all there's so many free themes that you can make it look like a really good website. Quick and dirty. Uh, YouTube. I'm going to tell you, YouTube, for me, is probably one of the m most uh, important components to my classes. Because every module in almost every class, I have YouTube videos about anything from the nature of light to uh, camera operation to renaissance. Uh, whatever I use these whether I create them myself I mean I taught a lighting class and I found great YouTube videos on how to pose the female pose the male and broad lighting short lighting Rembrandt lighting I just put them into the different modules and as a compliment so like the internet there's a lot of me and this is key there's a lot of mediocre or just plain bad stuff out there. As these new educators that we are in this new world, one of the job, one of our big jobs now is going out and finding and editing, not so much editing, but finding and evaluating the very best free content that I can incorporate into my class. So if there's eight posing videos out there in YouTube I got to look at all eight of them because seven of seven of them might be horrible but one might be a home run I mean, that's the one I'm going to use so I don't just do a search and go um, uh, lighting ratios I want to learn about lighting ratios oh there's 10 videos I got to look at them I don't look at the whole thing I know when three minutes, two, three minutes, if it's going to be good or not. But I find the very best, which most complements and supplements and reinforces the course content that I'm teaching. Okay. So, like the internet, there's a lot of mediocre stuff out there. Um, you want to search for the very best content out there and incorporate it. and they can be embedded directly into Blackboard. And this is where I'm going to jump into one of my classes. Since you guys are Blackboard people, I tell you what, I'm getting, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge zooming around these different, um, when I'm teaching with Hangouts and, and going back and forth between all these things. Okay, let me go to one of my classes now in Blackboard. All right, so for example, uh, this is a course. You're seeing my Art History Survey 2 course. And um, every and talk about the visual continuity and the design plan. If you go to assignments, I normally put, I put videos in three places. Assignments, discussion boards, and announcements. One thing I've learned is students... Uh, might not view it in one place, though, but they'll view it in another place. So, when I click on Gothic to Renaissance,
I've got the discussion board topic. Click here and they go to the chapter summary. Click here, it takes them to my lecture. My little lecture here about key points and a video about Jato right here. And then I have a series of pre-Renaissance videos here. Okay? So every students know they can read the text lecture and or watch the videos and the chapter summary. Let's go to the next one. I've laid them all out the same way. So we go to the 15th century in Northern Europe. Discussion topic, chapter summary, and video playlist. Now, I also go to the announcement. And let me scroll down my announcement. Now we're doing romanticism and realism. There's the lecture. But I also have a video there on romanticism. And we just did the Rococo period. And I put a video on Hogarth here. And here's a video on Rubens, a video on Rembrandt. So I'm constantly trying to find additional materials that relate to the assignment. Now let's go to the discussion board. I'm always the first one to post. So let's look at the Age of Enlightenment. I'm at the bottom. So what do I have here? This is my video lecture. So I created this lecture personally. Okay, so that, I am lecturing, I don't think you can hear it, but I am lecturing about the art at that period in time, neoclassical, allegory, all those things. So that's my voice and my lecture. I did this little video in iMovie. I used the podcast, I created the podcast in Audacity, I uploaded the MP3, into iMovie, and then I dropped in the slides, the images uh, that I pulled off of uh, copyright-free uh, images from, from Web Museum. And then in about 20 minutes, I had my lecture. And then all I had to do was upload it into, um, into YouTube. All right? So YouTube is such an important component of the way I teach because I really like them to have uh, video content, audio content, and text content, and graphics. The, do you see, how, so you all can see how I'm using that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's the deal. You can create your own instructional videos and upload them to YouTube. You can create your own channel and then embed your videos into your classes. Now, let me stay with that just for one moment. I ask myself, is if there's something I need to do, for example, I create all my own orientation videos because I want my course to have my person. We talked about our personality. So I create my own orientation to every class. It's me. I'm talking. And this one, I'm talking about art appreciation and what we're going to be doing in class and my expectations and how the blackboard works. Blah, blah, blah. So that's me, and that's in my channel. 
But when I go to cave paintings, I have a lecture in each one, but there's also other great videos about cave paintings and Egyptian art that I also include. So normally you ask yourself, can if you're teaching multimedia? Well, I teach multimedia, and one thing we do is we do video editing. And I, my students, uh, I give them, most of them are Mac, so I have all of the I, Apple uh, website tutorials to iMovie. Uh, I can't teach, I don't teach um, uh, Final Cut Pro, and the reason I don't is because it's only an eight-week mm -hmm. course. And I tried doing that a few years ago, and I said, forget it. What about Premiere? Um, they just didn't buy it for me, so I, oh. I only use Movie Maker, mm -hmm. Movie Maker or iMovie in the class, and Keynote. Right. Because uh, the students have to do podcasts, and they have to do videos. Um, so I go and get all the video tutorials from Apple. You know, how to edit, how to... You know, and they're embedded directly into my course. And this is all online, or is this a hybrid? Uh, this is a hybrid. Uh, so the main point I'm trying to make to you is this. You create the video audio content that is specifically going to reinforce your personality, and you can't find it anywhere else. And then you complement that with all the other videos. I mean, why should I do a Renaissance video when there's like some amazing Renaissance videos on PBS that I can put into my class? So these are, there's, and I, I guess what I'm saying is don't reinvent the wheel. It take, you know, it's a lot of work to do these things. It's a lot of work. So you got to come up with shortcuts, viable shortcuts. Um, so you decide where you want to embed your YouTube videos into your course, and you embed them. And I'm going to show you how to do that. I just um, thought of something. Yes, Ken. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, no, not at all. No problem. Uh, the um, when you're teaching the history of photography, uh, are are you uh, facing any copyright issues uh, when you want a particular photograph that you know is still under copyright? Uh, it, what what goes through your mind? How do you get around those problems? Well, we're in a transitional period right now with some new laws coming down through the Department of Education. And I, I might have mentioned this last week or the week before. Um, and different colleges have different rules here. Uh, many, many years ago, many years ago I wrote a letter to Eastman Kodak and I asked for their access to their online archive and they gave me total access to it to incorporate into my classes. Mm. So I did that years ago because I created the first history of photography online, totally online course, I think probably in the country because that was like 97. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody was teaching it totally online then. No. Mm. And they gave me that. But here's the point that I made, made to, I don't know if I said it last week or the week before. I want you to think about this. Ken, you're in the classroom. You've got an LCD projector. You've got 20 students. And you're projecting uh, Robert Kappa's work on the projector. Mm -hmm. You're projecting uh, uh, Diane Arbus' work. You're projecting uh, more contemporary photographers' work. Uh, the Star and Twins. You're projecting work that you're just online and you're going to Google Images and you're projecting work on the wall. Okay? It's a classroom. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between that and hyperlinking to an image on the web directly into your discussion board. There mm -hmm. is no difference. 
you're in a classroom, you're in a learning environment, and you're not using the image for any type of monetary uh, to make money with. You're just showing the image, which is already online for anybody to look at. Mm. Well, uh, uh, teachers over at NYU um, in, in Cinema Studies pulled a lot of uh, Xeroxes together and they stapled it and, and uh, were selling it in the bookstore. That's, that's... Couldn't do it. They got in a lot of trouble. They would, and they should get in trouble. Yeah. That's wrong. Yeah. Because they were selling it. Well, it may have been for cost. They wanted that work to be available to their students. They had researched all of this in various periodicals and it Xerox what they wanted and they had maybe a hundred or 150 page document that students had to buy right. to bring to class well, and the, and the, the copyright point, people went all over them. Well, the, the point here is this. You're in a password protected environment and all you're doing is hyperlinking. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if you'll notice because there's, there's new so a lot of new software out there and the new software will not let you hyperlink. So yeah. if you hyperlink to an image and it will create a big X, you know that they don't want you doing it. Right. I also never use an image that says the word copyright on it. Mm -hmm. But if the image is sitting in Google Images, there's no copyright on it, and it, and it will hyperlink, what is the difference? showing that in the classroom on an LCD and mm -hmm. me showing it in my password and protected class. Yeah. So to answer your question, I do it. Now let me tell you where I won't do it. Mm -hmm. I won't do it on my blog. Why? Beth, why won't I do it on my blog? One, one reason. Yeah. It's uh, it's open for everybody. It's open for everybody. It's not password protected. Mm -hmm. So there's your key. There's your key. Okay, sounds good. Because there's so much when when you use illustrations in in, a, in any still photography course, you're, you're pulling pictures from an, anywhere. Absolutely. New York Times, anything that looks like it should be demonstrated because it's relevant to what they're doing that day. Absolutely. I, I teach a course, in graphic design, we do a, a section called focal points. So I go to Google Images and I just type in focal points mm -hmm. and I project them. And yeah. I put those same images in my online course. Mm -hmm. I hyperlink to them. Yeah. I'm not making money. I'm just showing things that are already out there. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, it is important to, I, I'm, again, I'm just kind of reinforcing. It's important to preview these clips, these videos, to make sure you find the very best, highest quality videos that relate to and reinforce your content. Adding rich media content to your totally online and hybrid courses enables instructors to reinforce techniques and concepts demonstrated in the studio or in the field. Podcasts and video content also tap into a variety of learning styles. And I think you can see this is a video on photography that I embedded directly into a Blackboard discussion board post in my history of photography. Using Blackboard and or Moodle course management systems as supplements to my photography and art courses, or total, I can teach from anywhere and I can deliver and assess course content even if it's in, it is a hands-on photographic techniques. Student review the post, uh, posted podcast, videos and screencasts, then they post their own work based on the tutorials. So if I'm teaching them how to do depth of field or composites, I can do the video, I can do the screencast, and then they have to post their work. Watch this video. It shows you step by step how to do a, a three uh, image composite. Or watch this video. It shows you how to do a panoramic. Now, after you watch it, we're going to spend the next week you're going to post a minimum of six works in progress, six versions, until you get the most seamless panoramic or the most seamless composite 
based on the assignment parameters. So I'm using the video. I might also have it. I might have a text. Step step one. Step two. Open up a second uh, browser uh, Photoshop window. Step three. Select. Step four. Feather five percent. See what I'm saying? So I give it to them in text, and I give it to them in in video. Okay. What I want to do now is show you. Uh, I, I, I might have done this before, but do you want me to show you how to step by step to put the video content into the Blackboard? That would be good. Yeah. Okay. So what you do, I'll take you through the whole thing step by step. I'm going to have to get to my Blackboard. Bear with me because I'm, I'm going to have to go in and out of um, two different two different um, screen shares here. All right, screen share, go here. Okay, you should be able to see um, that video on my Baroque period uh, lecture. Now, point number one. The, the steps for embedding video in Blackboard are the exact same, whether it's an announcement, whether it's a discussion, whether it's an assignment, whether it's a lecture. It doesn't matter. It's always the exact same steps. Okay? These steps are taking, I have, uh, whether I showed you those two links, there's a video on how to do it. But I'm going to show you step by step. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to Google, uh, you're going to go to YouTube. So I'm going to go, uh, all right, now I've got to go to screen share. Just bear with me and we will go to YouTube now. I can't seamlessly go from one to the next, unfortunately. I'm in YouTube. So up here, I'm going to type um, basic Photoshop tutorials for beginners. And for the sake of the demonstration, I'm not going to spend all that time finding the very best because it's always the same. So let me click on this. All right, this is where I'm going to go slow. Okay. Now, I'm in YouTube. I've spent 15 minutes, and I've just found the perfect tutorial for my module for next week's class. Right here, do you see where it says share? Right there? Beth, you see where it says share? I click it. I'm going to click share. Now, this is the tricky part. You, this is the direct link to the video. You don't want that. You don't want that. What you want is embed. Embed. E-M-B-E-D. Embed. Click it. Now, here is the code. This is the code. Here's the code. Now, please note, please note, I'm assuming you both have uh, newer versions of Blackboard. So if you're in a newer version of Blackboard, it used to be that Blackboard only took the old embedding code. Um, so... What you're going to do is you're going to copy this code right here, and you're going to decide on the video size. You don't want, I normally do 640. 420 is too small. 640 is about the biggest you want for Blackboard. Now, copy that code. 
copy, not cut. All right, now I've just copied the code. I just copied that code. You with me? Now I'm going to go to my class. And I'm going to All right, you all should see the text editor in Blackboard. The text editor is always the same anywhere in Blackboard. Doesn't matter where you are. Assignments like whatever, any link, it's always the same text editor. Here's the trick. You must click the HTML toggle first because you're going to put HTML into that box. Get rid of this little doodad here and paste that code in there like that. So I've just pasted the code into the text editor. All right. Now, and remember, this is being recorded, so you can go back and watch this uh, video that I'm recording in, in Hangouts. Now, watch this. Then, all I do is I hit submit. And there's the video. The video is now directly embedded into the class. I do not like to link to videos. Why? Because when I link to videos, it puts a whole series of thumbnails of other videos when they click it. So they can get distracted and, you know, uh, skateboard madness. And next thing you know, they're teaching art history and they're watching videos on, <laughs> on something completely different. So you want to embed directly. And it's the same principle for Moodle. It's the same routine for Moodle. You've got to click the HTML toggle first. Okay? You got that? Now, I'm going to delete that because I don't want that in my class. All right. Um, I want to. All right, I'm going to pull out a, um, podcast. Bear with me just, okay, MP4. Now, um, let me go back to screen share. Okay, so. Now you know how to put a video in. If you go to iTunes University, or if you create an, an MP4 or an MP3, all you have to do is put it in. You can also put a podcast into Blackboard. So I've already dragged a MP4 out onto my desktop from iTunes. And I'm going to show you how to upload it into Blackboard. So this could be a podcast that you did. So I'll go back to Blackboard. Start screen share. I'm back in Blackboard. Now, I hit, uh, I hit reply. So when you want to put a podcast into your, into your, um, you go right here where it says add MP, you see this one right here? M-P-E-G-A-V-I. You click it. And you browse. And you find your podcast. Open. Oh, I, got, I got the wrong file. But anyway, um, this is where you put in MP3s, and if you have QuickTimes, here's QuickTime for QuickTime files. 
depending upon how it's saved. And you can, and uh, you can put your podcast directly into your course. Uh, let's see if I can quickly go to one in my commercial. I'll, I'll quickly go to one and show you what I'm talking about. Can you still, yeah, you still see what I'm doing. Show you what a uh, enhanced podcast would look like under lectures. All right. Do you see where it says midterm review enhanced podcast right here? So this is their, their commercial photography class. Here is their podcast. I created it in Audacity and uploaded it using that little thing I showed you. It's taking a, it's trying to download it. It might be because I'm on wireless. It's still spinning. Okay, I'm going to let that download while I jump over back to the, I'll show you that in a few minutes when, when it downloads. And why is it taking a while? Number one, I'm on wireless. Number two, it's an enhanced podcast, and I embedded it directly into the class. What did we say about that? We said it takes up a bunch of memory on the Blackboard. I should have put it into the YouTube, but I didn't. All right. When you provide the link, is it just like you would for WordPress? Oh, wait a minute. Um, cancel. Here it is. I'll, I'll get back to you in a second on that one. Okay. All right, there it is. This is the podcast. It's audio lecture with little pictures, little thumbnails. And that's about 60 megabytes. I'm lecturing about the studio and about the different cameras. All right. I want one of those uh, perspective uh, shift lenses. Yes, yes, I got gotcha. you. Um, Okay, so we're just going to wrap that up. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so the point here is this. You can produce your own podcasts and upload them into iTunes U if you've got iTunes U. Or you can go to iTunes U and download the MP3s and put them directly into your class. Uh, you've got a lot of options. Um and I showed you our our iTunes site. I, I have to reactivate the login to get back in. We've already mentioned that point. So make it make sure iTunes is loaded on your computer. You do a search. What are you teaching? See if there's anything out there, uh, and see if there's anything viable out there on on the history of photography or photo theory or you, using the view camera, whatever it might be, and then you download it, and then you embed it into your course. So once it has been completely downloaded to the iTunes on your computer, all you need to do is take your, uh, uh, drag it to your desktop or right-click and copy to your desktop. You will see an MP3 or an MP4 file. This you will upload into that little icon I showed you uh, um, in Blackboard. Go to the Blackboard, open the text editor where you want the students to access. 
uh, click the uh, third icon bottom left of the text editor and upload the MP3 or MP4 file. This may take a few minutes because it's a large file, just like I had to deal with. And this is what you would see, and you would browse, upload. You can set the width and the height and hit submit. And what I just showed you was now the iTunes lecture is embedded into your Blackboard. Another option is for the students uh, is the students to go to that iTunes site and get it, but they got to do about five clicks to get there. I also do instructional videos. So when I'm doing it, I'm in the studio and I'm teaching them how to do tabletop photography. I keep a, a flip cam with me at all times. I put the flip cam onto the, uh, these are for hybrids. I take the flip cam, I put it on a tripod for every demonstration I do. I take that flip cam, put it on a tripod, tell a student to tra just kind of keep, keep me in view and I do my hour lecture demonstration, use this light at this light ratio. We're going to light the side for texture. I want you to use a gel here, blah, blah, blah. Now I've got a video. I go back, I edit it in iMovie, upload it, and I drop it right into my class. So the students, it's a hybrid. What if the student missed the class? Mr. Keogh, I missed the demo. Go to the Blackboard, watch my video, right? Or, Mr. Keogh, I, I, I didn't get it all. Go watch it again till you get it. Uh, instructional podcasts. So at the beginning of the course, I have, an, I, I have a little picture of me in an iPod. They click it, and they can hear my course orientation. So I have the audio version, the video version, and the text version built into my class. And then in my portfolio class, all the students will not only do uh, still digital portfolio, e-portfolio, but they do a video portfolio. And they upload that uh, into their blogs. All right, I've already put the link to iTunes in the chat box. And uh, okay, on the right, everybody, do you see the second link on the chat box? HTTP www Carteret. Do you all see that in the chat box? Do you see it? No, I don't. I don't really know what the chat you gotta box. You got to scroll the chat box up. <laughs> I'll put it I'll, I'll put it in again. We've got to see what you're working. The group chat. No, no, I'm going to paste it again. Now do you see it? We don't see the same screen. Oh, no, you have to click your chat on your left oh, to see the oh, chat oh, box. Oh, I'm sorry. But I don't know where the chat box the is. On the left of your screen, it says chat, screen share, capture, cameraman. Yeah, I see those. Click chat. Okay. And then you should oh, see, now I see it. Okay. a hyperlink. Yes, I see that. I just did a change in screen size. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, All gotcha. Right. Under your All name. Right. Yeah, so what I'm going to do... You click on that? Well, I'm going to show you something. Let me... Yeah, you can click on that if you have iTunes on your computer. One moment, please. Connect yeah, it takes a iTunes. second. It takes a second. It's going to say iTunes, choose an application. All right. So we're going to wrap up with following me on this. 
going to go to iTunes now that I reactivated it. You should see my iTunes site, correct? Carter at iTunes. I got, got the, right. gear. the gear is still turning. Okay. But you can see Carter at iTunes, yes. right? Yeah. All right. Follow with me now. I'm going to show you how this works. Okay. So do you see where it says Photography Technology tab? Yes. I'm going to click on that. And I have basic lighting in studio. All right? Let me click on that. Now, here we have my lectures. Do you see them in the bottom? All of these lighting overview, nature of light, lighting equipment demo, uh, high key lighting, flash, Rembrandt lighting. Do you see that on my screen, on the, on the Google screen? Yes. Okay. So what the students would do is, and the, the ones that have little icons right here like this, those are videos. Mm -hmm. The student would click get it downloads to their computer or to their mobile device and they can listen to the lecture. So what I do is I put the link to the iTunes site into their course and I tell them subscribe. They can subscribe to right here, uh, Beth and, and, and uh, Ken, they can click subscribe. So when they click subscribe, every single lecture that I do or add to that link will automatically download to their device. So when I'm teaching lighting, I have every lecture as an audio podcast and, and I have some of them as video podcasts. So I tell the students, make sure you get those podcasts because those are going to supplement the hybrid course. If you miss my demonstration on RIM and Rembrandt lighting, Make sure you go to and get the podcast. So podcasts are great rich media. And since I'm teaching, uh, what I did was the last three years of teaching, I made it a point to videotape and, and as many demonstrations as I could and audio tape and digitally record every lecture and put them into my uh into my iTunes. So uh, I have seven graphics, nine commercial, um, 11 portfolio, okay, 16 basic lighting, um, multimedia, I got 70. Uh, oh, you would, you would appreciate this, Ken. Mm -hmm. I have all the students, every project they do, I put into my multimedia. So all the students have to do their videos, and I up I upload them into uh, the iTunes as a repository. All right. So they're all there. Their and this projects. is all free. The space is all free. All free. Hmm. Apple gives each college five hundred gigabytes of free space. You just have to ask your college IT department to request uh, to contact their Apple representative to mm -hmm. find out the you've got some paperwork to fill out and some uh, your IT people have to embed the code. Uh, you have to match up your your server with the Apple server. They send you the directions. So I, but I could find my university uh, at iTunes University, I guess, to find out if they've uh, yes. they've started this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then That's you could idea. just get your password mm -hmm. and upload your content into it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So cool. um, we talked about podcasting. We talked about blogging. Uh, we talked about iTunes University. Uh, I want to just leave you today with just keep in mind that there's way more things out there that we're ever going to master. And we have to take baby steps. 
don't let this overwhelm you, okay? We have to do this incrementally. I didn't get, and I've been doing this since 96. A lot of it is intuitive now, but it wasn't intuitive in 96. So you've got to start somewhere. And you, as you create each lesson, you ask you those questions. What do I have to communicate to the students? What do I have to assess? What do they need to learn? What are the, what, I think a video might work here, a screen video, uh, a podcast. And as you move forward, you're going to learn these new applications. For example, if you want to do podcasting and you start doing these audio lectures, download Audacity. And all of the links on the tutorials I gave you access to. Um, it's just a matter of starting and moving forward step by step with it. And you're going to make mistakes. You know, you got to climb the learning curve. But all of a sudden, you're going to realize you're going to have a flow. You're going to say, okay, every lecture I'm going to do a podcast, or I might do a video demonstration, or I'm going to go find a great video out there that I'm going to embed. And then all of a sudden, you realize in two years, your course becomes much more richer and lots more resources. Uh, it, it just takes time. It takes time to, to build it and to, uh, to drive that car, to really master these tools. And as I mentioned before, all of the things we talked about are right here on the Moodle VASA course right here and all the downloads and if you go to the bottom the very bottom I also have links for you number 11 I have Jing screencasting download screen sharing join me WordPress for ePortfolios iTunes U Audacity download slide share for PowerPoints, photo bucket, all the podcasting tools, directory, all those are downloads free that you can that you can um, start playing with. So I hope your heads aren't hurting too bad with with all these things, but keep in mind that you've taken the first step taking this workshop. You you've made it a point to Expand your horizons and uh, and be open to new ways of teaching. And the best advice is don't be afraid to just go out there and do it and try it. And, and, and when you make a mistake, just say, okay, I learned from that. I'm moving forward. And, and you're going to learn from the students and you're going to find out what works and what doesn't work. And you ask your students, hey, did that module, did that get the point across? Things like that. Now, what we'll do uh, for the final module is just email me with some possible dates that you and times that you'd like to do our final one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think it's most uh, helpful to everybody in the workshop to do the last class in a one-on-one -on -one where I can surgically address your specific issues and I can help you write in your Blackboard or and, and really work with you for 90 minutes uh, 60, 90 minutes, uh, addressing any specific things you've got as you absorb and think about uh, all the things we've talked about the first five uh, lessons. So all I'll need is, uh, I need to do this before April 11th, because I'm leaving for I'm leaving for Guatemala on April 11th. So I'd like to meet with you uh, one more time, one on one. Mm -hmm. uh, just tell me what's good for you and we'll work it out Okay. in an email. Uh, any final questions, uh, observations, thoughts? No, it's been great. Learned a lot. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm going to look at that video again as soon as you post it. A couple things I want to check out. Great. A lot of stuff there. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It, a lot of stuff for the regular classes. It doesn't have to be hybrid or all online. I mean, I've seen Absolutely. stuff 
that I can bring into Blackboard that I hadn't thought I could do. Absolutely. And, you know, this is so, this has been terrific. I really appreciate it. And the, the key point here is we've got the entire world at our fingertips now. The classroom doesn't have to be the, the studio in the darkroom in our, in our little institution. Mm -hmm. Now we've can, we can bring so many things to our students. We just have to direct them and we have to incorporate it into that learning process. Mm -hmm. And get them used to using the new tools. One thing I, I say to know, my student, go ahead, they, kid. They think they know everything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, new media, okay, you know. Uh, I'm not <laughs> going there know? with that one. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah. Uh, one thing I do uh, at the begin beginning of every class that I teach, I make it very, every hybrid class, I say, listen, you've got me for two hours. It's a seven-hour class. I want to be very clear that we are going to use a variety of learning tools, applications, and it's up to you. To, don't just count on the two hours with me. There are videos, there are podcasts, there are tutorials, and they're for you to learn, but you've got to take responsibility for your learning. In other words, I'm going to do a 90-minute demonstration on video editing. But if you're still really uncomfortable with it or you're struggling with it, there's six tutorials on that blackboard. And I, I expect you to go and watch them. So I try to really make it clear that edu the education now is more than the talking head in front of the class, that they've got to use the resources. I've already gone and gotten them, and I put them and packaged them into the blackboard or the Moodle. They're there for you. They're there for you to use. So be proactive with your education. When your um, colleges, when you offer a class, let's say it's a hybrid, do they offer a traditional class? They try, Beth, but not all the time. It's, it's, it's a goal, but it doesn't always happen. And, and, it, and that for two reasons. For example, history of photography, for a long time we did history of photography online, history of photography on classroom. Psychology online in the classroom, sociology online in the classroom. But like we said at the very beginning of the class today, this is student driven, budget driven, technologically driven. And when you've got 60 students signing up for the online version and six signing up for the classroom, mm -hmm. the rule at our college now, they're not going to let a class go unless it's got 10. Right. you got to be able to pay the instructor's fee. So if you've got set, they used to go, okay, eight, you used to be able to fight it. It's getting harder and harder mm -hmm. because of budget restraints. So, I mean, all you have to do is the math. Mm -hmm. if, if you've got three Art of Pre's going online and filling them, and you can't fill an Art of Pre in the classroom, even though it would be great to have that classroom course, it's not cost effective for the college to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get a couple of students complaining, well, I don't learn that well online. I wanted the classroom version. We're sorry. Only six people signed up. We couldn't run the class. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening. In North Carolina, online has grown uh, 70, oh, there was some incredible number, 74%. Sure. And, uh, and classroom has gone uh, minus 2%. Some, and it's just, it gives students so many more options. But with that, the teacher has to be uh, uh, educated and, 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 and given the tools and the training to do it right. Because I, I know so many excellent teachers in the classroom. And they were told, I think I mentioned this, an English teacher, old school, phenomenal teacher. Then they told her she had to teach online. She was horrible. I mean, all kinds of complaints. Because she didn't get enough, she wasn't proactive enough to get the uh, training. And, you know, she didn't take it seriously enough. But this is where it's going. And you want to be the best you can be. Not only because you personally want to be the best you can be, I have no doubt of that, 
but it also will make you much more marketable. Ken can be teaching for three different schools outside of his state. Yeah. And so can you. Once you master, get to the point where you're confident in totally doing this. And when I meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, I'll show you how to migrate whatever you did on Moodle into your Blackboard. Uh, quick question. Is there such a thing as a Moodle or Blackboard Service Bureau uh, uh, server uh, for people not affiliated with institutions? Uh, Ken, what, what you have to do uh, with Moodle, you could use anything like GoDaddy. Uh, mm -hmm. You can use any remote hosting service yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know a guy that's got his own little server in his house and he hosts it himself. Blackboard, you would have to go, it, it would not be, Ken, it would not be um, cost effective in any way, shape, or form for you to get a Blackboard license. They're, it's astronomical. Mm -hmm. But almost all schools that you're going to work for online, they're going to say, you're going to be working on Moodle or you're going to be working on Blackboard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you how to archive your course in Blackboard because say, Ken, you, you're a multimedia course and you get it looking really good and another college says, hey, Ken, we want you teaching for us. You don't have to rebuild it. All you got to do is download the archive and upload the archive into the new template at the other school and it unfolds. You got the whole thing, bam, done. Uh, can an institution lock that? If, if they if they maintain uh, that it's their I haven't content. seen I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea. I've never asked anyone. When I left my school, uh, I downloaded all my courses as archives and saved them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's been two hours, gang. Um, just like Beth sent me a list of questions this past week, and I responded to them. Uh, point by point. If you have any questions after you sit for an hour to go, oh, I wish I asked him that, send me uh, an email and I'll respond back to you in a timely fashion. All right. Thank you, Thank Pat. you. Okay. You have a, a great rest of the day and uh, I will be back with you on scheduling that last one-on-one -on -one session. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So long.